uh, welcome you again to the Data Color 2012 webinar series, and I would like to introduce my co-host, David Saffer, who is a professional photographer, commercial and fine art photography, along with photo education from uh, Southern California. I'm David Toby, Product Technology Manager here at Data Color for the Spider line of products. And uh, this is going to be a fairly informal webinar covering a lot of photographic topics uh, in the guise of holiday photography. So we hope it will be mildly entertaining as well as uh, mildly educational for different people at different levels. Now we're not going to be answering a lot of questions during the webinar since we'll both be contributing and speaking. But we'll try to catch a few if we can manage it. Now there will be um, a giveaway of a Spider 4 Pro at the end of the presentation and uh, an announcement of some some specials as well, so you want to stick around for that. Uh, if you if you set your screen up such that you can see the chat box, then if we do manage to answer any questions, you'll be able to see the answers when they come up there, not just to your questions, but to everyone's questions. And uh, beyond that, we're just going to start off here and uh, and see how this all uh, works out. So welcome, David. Hi everybody and welcome to the webinar. We're going to talk about getting the most out of your holiday photos. Uh, as David said, it's going to be a little bit informal, um, but we are going to dig down into some of the details and uh, hopefully help you uh, with your upcoming events and outings and things like that. And hopefully you'll pick up some tips. You know, one of the things that's absolutely true is the size of the camera matters a lot less than the skill of the photographer. It's, it's often said that the best camera in the world is the one you have with you at the right moment. And in many cases, it's the small adjustments and tweaks that matter the most. It's, it's the on-camera controls and getting those little nuances just right so that the, the photograph really sings when you, uh, when you look at it or it pops when you look at it. And we'll talk about camera controls and lighting and flash and camera supports, a little bit about editing. And we're also going to show you a few examples of holiday photos and talk a little bit about the stories behind them. Well, I would uh, add that Steve still said, love the one you're with. And in the camera sense, what that really comes down to is if you're going to carry a camera, you should love that camera enough to learn about that camera and learn what works well with that camera. People often compliment me on my iPhone photography and say, wow, I thought it took a big expensive camera to take photos like that. And the answer is, if you're going to shoot with an iPhone, you have to know what things an iPhone shoots well and, and utilize that strength. So some of the things to consider are planning ahead. You know, what sort of shots do you want to get? What, uh, do you have a shot list? Some people do that. They write them down, um, particularly ahead of, a, say, a big event. Um, do you want to be indoors and outdoors? Um, do you want environmental shots or opportunistic ones? Uh, do you have groups or couples or individuals that you want to photograph? What about props and backgrounds? Um, one of the things that really helps, particularly this time of year, is to have a few props around and let people play with them. Some of the, what about basic image editing? Have you considered what you're going to do about that? Some people don't do any image editing. Others do quite a bit. And one of the main things, though, is to practice. Is practice, practice, practice. Take the camera with you pretty much all the time now, and if you can, and just practice taking different shots and practice some of the techniques, maybe even some of the things we're going to show you today. And I know there's a story behind each one of these photos, David, if you, if you want to <laughs> chime in here. Well, the, uh, the Marley tram that, that drives around the center of the city in Zurich is uh, only for small children. And people actually take their children there and put them on this tram and let them go around the city all by themselves, though they aren't entirely by themselves. There are young women dressed up as angels reading stories on the Marley tram. But this is just an example of outside photography. It is an example of having to be prepared. Do you know how many blurry photos of this tram I have? I mean, it's not an easy background. Now, one could make an impossible decision, like I would like to take portraits of my family in front of the Marley tram. To do that, you're going to have to find out where it stops, how long it stops. You're going to have to set your people up in advance, make sure the light's in your direction, that you have a good angle. 
and you're going to have to let the tram drive into and stop in your picture, not the other way around. You're never going to compose an image by trying to get people to stand in front of it after it stops there, or you'll never get it in time. So that's the kind of preparation that David's talking about here. And now this other photo Where was is, this taken, David, by the way? Well, that's Zurich in, in Switzerland. Um, they have, and of course, what they're celebrating there specifically is not Christmas, it's St. Nicholas Day, which is like December 4th. So that's, that's not Santa Claus driving the tram, that's, that's uh, the Tyrolean uh, St. Nick, who we'll, who we'll see later on this presentation, I believe. Oh. We'll also see more about uh, lobster boats and the, the bizarre ideas of holiday celebrations in Maine later in this presentation. Oh, all right. Now we have a little poll for you before we keep going, before we get going again. And I'd like to know what camera you plan to use for most of your holiday photos. And of course, there's phones on the cameras. There's point and shoots, the little cameras that fit in your pocket. The all-in-ones, which are the slightly larger pocket uh, cameras, they're not really pocket cameras. They frequently have a zoom lens and sort of resemble a shrunken DSLR. Um, the DSLRs themselves are something else. And remember to uh, answer this in the poll answer, not in the uh, not in the comment section. I see a number of people have added comments about what they use. So what I'm seeing here is, as a result, three percent phone cameras. Now I I refuse to believe only three percent of you will actually take holiday <laughs> photos with a phone. You're just not admitting it. Uh, Four percent <laughs> point and shoot. Uh, that seems a little low as well. Four percent all in one, which I think. Probably I'd name that category mirrorless these days. It's moving in that direction. And 87% DSLR. Now, the 1% other must either be using multiple cameras or film cameras, or I'd love to hear that they're using Hasselblads and Leafs and various types of medium format cameras, but that's a pretty tricky device to be using for holiday photos. Yes. So some basic operating tips. The best tip I can give you ever is read the manual. That way your camera probably won't look like this one. Um, keep the camera dry. Um, certainly today I would have a challenge with that here where I live. Um, use the correct charger, you know, all the obvious things. Um, one thing that is important, uh, it's, it's, there's plenty of times where people uh, with smaller cameras will put their fingers in front of the flash or the lens. and it actually, if you're taking a lot of photographs on a smaller camera and you put your finger up right on the flash, you're going to feel it. It's going to get hot. So take care with that. Um, and another tip that, that may be not so obvious is a lot of the smaller memory cards are fragile. So be gentle with them if you're taking them in and out of the camera. Take extra cards with you because if that card fills up, you're kind of out of luck. And they're so inexpensive now, there's just no excuse. Now this diagram on the right, I'll apologize for it a little bit. It comes right out of a manual. Um, I think it's kind of funny that Nikon uh, felt the need to point to the lens, but <laughs> it just cracked me up. But there are, you know, the basic controls on the camera here, which are, are pretty obvious. There was a poll recently I saw about two-thirds of DSLR owners use the auto setting. Now I'm pretty sure that's not true of this group. Um, generally the people that come to our webinars are people who are pretty savvy. Um, but full auto can make mistakes and I think we all know how on full auto and full matrix metering how uh, the meter can get fooled by strong backlighting and things like that in, in many cases. Well, I, I would jump in here a second David and say not only can full metering make mistakes, full metering takes away some of the, some of the creative opportunities. If you that's use true. full metering what's going to happen is in auto mode you will get photos that look like other people's photos and if you if you don't have the knowledge of photography or the creative bent to want your photos to look different than that that's fine I mean that's what we call the line them up and shoot them photos it consists of automatic mode with the flash on everybody lined up against the wall and easy easy <laughs> yeah I, I, I feel I, I refuse to take that particular photograph um, yeah. that, Everybody says to me at holiday gatherings, well, you won't even take a photo of us? I mean, you're supposed to be a photographer. And I say, I've been taking photos of you all day. I'm just not going to line you up and shoot you. <laughs> so to speak. 
Um, so it's important to learn the basic controls and some of the manual settings. Uh, there are some on, on some of these cameras. Uh, they've moved the, the, the control from buttons on the camera to menu choices on the LCD on the back, which has you know pros and cons that are pretty obvious. There are presets on the camera for all kinds of what they call scene modes. Um, I'm not a big proponent of those. If, if just shooting on full auto sort of puts you in a box, using the scene modes, usually they're pretty much over the top and don't really give the kind of results that most people want. Yeah, the one place where scene modes are justified is with a camera that doesn't give you manual controls to make adjustments for specific types of things that don't shoot well in just kind of generic mode. And I believe we'll have a screen in one place in this in this uh, entire presentation that suggests using some kind of preset, uh, which is rare for either David or I to suggest that. Yep. So some of the things we're going to talk about um, going forward our flash controls. I think that you know a lot of these shots are going to be in the evening, um, the indoors or outdoors, indoors, and so the flash controls are pretty important. Understanding how to use the flash is pretty important. Um, light balance, um, ISO or the camera sensitivity, um, the aperture and shutter controls give you a lot of opportunities to um, exercise your your artistic feeling about what kind of photograph you want to get. Um, a little bit about exposure compensation and focus, but but not a lot. I want to concentrate really on getting getting the the, the photograph right in the camera uh, at a at a fundamental level. I wouldn't say basic level, a fundamental level. Now here's the thing with flash. Most people that I know uh, automatically assume that flash has one speed or two speeds on and off, and that's not the case. Just about every camera that has a flash, somewhere on there, there is a control or set of controls that lets you increase and decrease flash intensity. And what you're really doing is you're mixing the flash intensity with the ambient lighting. And the more you can blend them, and I'll show you a, fo a couple of photographs a little later, the more you can blend the ambient lighting and the flash, the less it's going to look like a... Uh, 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 a picture taken on the streets of New York by somebody like Ouija, who, or, 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 you know, it, it's not going to have that deer in the headlights look to it. Um, some cameras have a pop-up flash. Uh, some cameras have a built-in flash on the front. Uh, in either case, they work okay, but they have a limited range. And so, it, it, great example if you have a long table with people, uh, perhaps they've just sat down to dinner. Um, that flash is going to illuminate everybody within, say, eight or nine feet, and the people at the other end of the table, you'll never see them. So that's when you turn some of the lights on in the room, um, and you turn up the ISO in the camera, those kinds of things, to get as much range as you can. Um, yeah, also, the, the table photo is the classic ghosts at the front and ghouls at the back scenario for a small flash. So uh, yeah. the other thing to remember is the smaller your flash and the closer it is to the lens, the more it will create red eye. Just the, the level of, of lift that you see on the professional flash in the middle image here is sufficient to eliminate most red eye. Yes, I didn't, I didn't think of that. Good point. Um, the, the flash is adjustable. And in fact, a good example on the lower right in this slide um, on the Nikon speed lights and on the Canon lights, there's a button that you push to select uh, a particular adjustment, and then you can move that flash intensity down. And generally speaking, I'm going to, you know, the flash intensity is, is set by the guts of the camera in response to the, the ambient lighting, um, distance to subject, and things like that. And if you find that you... Um, you you know your the closer subjects are too bright or you've got other issues. Try to, uh, turning that flash down to half power. Uh, you'd be amazed at how good the photographs look. Instead of again looking like the deer in the headlights, all of a sudden you've got a really nice blend of ambient and fill light, and people look really good and they'll thank you for it. Now, the hot shoe flash can be really versatile. That's the one that's uh, in the middle photograph bottom here. 
and I put a red circle around it because the flash head on most of these units can swivel and swing up and down. And it's remarkably effective to bounce the flash off the ceiling or a nearby wall as long as it's not painted green or orange or something like that. And so you can see here I have a photograph with front lighting. Uh, I actually did a job at an event in a room that was so big and the ceiling was so high that I had just about no choice but to use frontal lighting and I, you know they they look like they're newspaper photos. On the other hand, in the, in the shot on the right, uh, I had a really nice white ceiling that was only about was only about a 12 foot ceiling, and I dialed the flash back to about three quarters and tilted it at about 45 degrees. Now the reason I do that is that some of the light coming from the flash head is going to go straight to the subject but probably 70% of that light is going to bounce off the ceiling and come back down. So it fills in under the eyes and under the nose a little bit so you don't have harsh shadows. But it gives a very nice, soft, flattering light to the subject and people really like that. And of course, it's great for skin tones and there's no red eye. Um, some of the other things you might want to do are, are night shots. David, you want to talk about this photo a little bit? <laughs> Well, clearly this is a main photograph. I don't know anywhere else where they decorate lobster boats competitively for the holidays. <laughs> but uh, obviously what you're looking at here is a situation where you have bright lights in a dark space and um, one moving object or another, we're out on the water here, and these are not ideal conditions. And tripod is not really an option, so you need to take your, your shot fast. You can see even the screen view of this, that the quality of this image is not as good as it could be. Uh, that's what happens when you whip your iPhone out of your pocket and, and take a photograph, or when you work with a small camera where you don't have a lot of settings adjustments. But the content of this photo is so compelling that working with it in Photoshop or Lightroom and getting a salvageable photo out of it is, uh, is worthwhile just because, I mean, how often do you see Christmas boats? That's just too fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I love the reflections in this image, too. Yeah, well, most everything looks better in water. And when, when's the last time you saw the North Atlantic um, calm enough that you could see reflections in it? That's for sure. Now, let's talk about white balance for a minute, because white balance is going to give you a, how do I say this? It tunes the camera, and it, it, it adjusts or adapts the current lighting conditions so that your white and neutral tones like gray appear normal so they don't have a blue cast or a yellow cast you know, from incandescent lighting. Now sometimes you'll want that and we're going to talk about that in a minute but if you do want a neutral photo there's a couple of ways to, to achieve that. One of them is, is that there are presets in the camera for different lighting conditions. I'll say right up front it's never perfect because the, the ambient lighting is never going to be exactly 3000 degrees Kelvin or your flash is never going to be exactly 5400 degrees and that's the only light source. So either you're dealing with mixed lighting, but the predominant lighting is the one that you sh is is the is the thing that directs your choice of the preset. Now, there's another way to do that which is with the data color spider cube and without getting into a lot of details, we have an hour long webinar on using the spider cube to manage uh, color and exposure and some other things. But the spider cube is very, very versatile tool for helping you set in-camera white balance, for helping you manage the exposure in the camera. And I'd encourage you to take a visit to the data color uh, website and the webinar page and, uh, and at least sample that and see if it's something that can help you. Now David, this is, this is one of your photos. I wondered if you want to speak about it a little bit. Well, there's more than one thing to talk about here, but you'll notice that there are two things going on here. There is the evening shot under the evening lighting, and that is showing here as blue. And then there are the windows in the library, which are incandescently lit from the inside, and they're showing yellow. So uh, if you open this in an advanced image editor like Lightroom, there will be a slider there called color temperature. We could make everything that's outside perfectly neutral, at which point the yellow windows would be screamingly yellow, or we could make, and I don't know why we would choose to do this, the windows neutral and everything outside would be screamingly blue. But there's something pleasant 
about the indoor-outdoor combination that you can get in the evening where you have a blue lighting outside and a yellow lighting inside. It makes it look cool outside, which in a winter shot like this is a good idea anyways. It makes it look warm and inviting inside. It just gives a sense of, um, of place and of temperature to the, to the entire scene. Now, if there were a spider cube in this shot and we were to correct to it, we would end up with dead neutrals on the front of that building. Uh, and screaming yellows from the inside lighting. If there were a cube, spider cube inside the building being shown on by the incandescent lighting, we would get the opposite effect. You're never going to match mixed lighting unless you do it through some kind of selection-based situation, which is you know, not very time-consuming. However, you get to choose between your light sources. And here the choice has been not to leave this as blue as it came out of the camera, but to leave it just blue enough to have that tint to it. Yeah, I very much like the ambiance in this photo. So one of the tools that's available to you um, is the ISO or the sensitivity, and that used to refer to the film sensitivity to light. And in the in the past, it ranged as low as 25, which is rarely seen now. And we have cameras that go to over 20,000. I don't even know what the record is anymore, um, but. In film, high ISO equaled film grain, and in a lot of digital cameras, um, the lowest setting is 100 or 200. If you and, and in some cameras, there's really good compensation for digital noise at high ISO, but there are still many cameras, as you can see in these two photographs. Um, one is pretty clean, and the other one's got a lot of noise in it. There are still a lot of cameras out there where you go much over 800 and the photo almost becomes unusable. Uh, so you have to balance that. Now, how would you balance that? Turn on some of the lights in the room or use some flash and supplement and use those tools. And of course, you would also adjust shutter and aperture, which we'll get into in a minute. But you use low ISO in good light and a higher ISO in low light. You increase the sensitivity in low light. So one thing I'll guarantee you is you'll never get red eye when you're photographing dogs. You'll, you'll get a different eye color because they have a different reflective membrane in their eye. But uh, the, other than that, the situation is identical. If you use in-camera flash, you'll have to correct the eye in the pets. And many of the red eye tools don't actually work for cats and dogs because they're actually looking for red. Others um, simply neutralize the area and it doesn't matter what color it was to start with. So some of them work for red-eye reduction on pets and others don't. This puppy just looks so patient. <laughs> now the ISO settings can be found on the exterior of the camera in a lot of cases, um, but I do own a camera uh, that has it in, it's a Canon G10 and it has those in the LCD control. So you have to read the manual and find them and know where they are, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, the moral of the story is that the Easter egg hunt for any given setting on any given camera has gotten larger over the years as we develop more and more firmware menus within the cameras. So it's kind of like walking to the supermarket and you want rice crackers. Are they going to be with crackers? Are they going to be with organic food? Are they going to be with ethnic food? Uh, there's 18 mm -hmm. places you might possibly find those rice crackers. And it's the same deal when you're looking for something in your camera now. Yeah, that's for sure. So discussing aperture and shutter controls, these are the, the gateways for light to your camera. And the aperture, in a way, is, is like a, a pipeline or a garden hose. And the bigger the aperture, the more light that it lets in. Um, the way we describe aperture, though, is through a math formula, which I won't get into. Um, but at the end of the day, you should know that the smaller the number, the bigger the aperture. So f2.8 is a big aperture. Like the one at the top is probably um, f2 or f2.8. And the one at the bottom is probably f18. Um, and the smaller the aperture, obviously, the less light that it lets in. The shutter covers the film plane or the digital sensor, and it moves and to expose your film or sensor. And actually, I took a picture of a film camera because obviously you can't get the back off a digital camera to show the shutter. And uh, this is made up of little panels of fabric that move up and down 
uh, at different speeds. And the faster the shutter, of course, the more likely it is the camera will freeze the action. Well, I'm very disappointed, Dave. I thought you were going to explain the inverse square law. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not smart enough. <laughs> um, one of the great things about understanding aperture is that it controls the what some people call the area of acceptable sharpness. In other words, the, that area of sharpness begins at a predictable distance from the camera depending on the aperture you're using and it extends for a predictable distance from the camera. And so you can control what's in focus and what's not using not in focus what's apparently sharp and what's not by using the aperture. And that's a very useful artistic tool because you could if you wanted to open that lens all the way up say to f2.8 and only certain things that you want to be, to be sharp and apparent to the viewer, and we'll show you an image in a minute, will be sharp and everything else will fall away. And if you wanted a lot of depth of focus, then you would stop it down and you would see a lot more of the detail in the scene that you've been photographing. So you can set the camera to what's called aperture priority and all of a sudden you have a lot of artistic control over what that viewer is going to pay attention to. And that's a cool thing. So this is a photograph. Um, this is one that David took. And uh, this is a pretty much wide open aperture. And you can see that just a plane, and I'm going to use the pointer here, just this plane here appears to be sharp in the photograph. Things that are closer are not. Things that farther are farther away are not. And just imagine the creative possibilities that are open to you when you really understand um, what each aperture setting will do for you in, in terms of what some people call depth of field. Um, it really gives you a lot of control over, over the final image. And I shoot 90% of the time in aperture priority. Yeah, and of course the beauty of this is you get to decide what you're going to accent. If that had been about the granite wall in the back, then you can make a shallow focal plane there. But if choosing to make a focal plane where the, the uh, Christmas tree ornaments were, simply emphasizes those more than if the entire image were in focus. Besides, we all get to be impressionist painters if we get to have three quarters of our canvas be beautiful out of focus colors. Yeah, it can really make for some special images. In fact, the image on this, um, this particular slide uh, focuses on the photographs on the clothesline and gives a beautiful painterly effect in the background because the, uh, the aperture is wide open. You can even count the blades in their shutter from the, uh, the shapes of the, uh, the uh, out of focus areas. Mm -hmm. So here's some examples of how you can combine aperture shutter control and ISO. There's thousands and thousands of permutations of course, but you know, a typical example in bright daylight, you might set the aperture at f8 and a fast shutter speed, say a 200th, and a relatively low ISO. And at twilight, you open the aperture. You might have a mid or slower shutter speed, and you'd use flash or higher ISO to keep that shutter speed up so that you don't get camera shake or wobbly pictures. Um, indoors in normal lighting, um, you know, a mid aperture, uh, mid to upper shutter speed, increase the ISO and, ISO and shoot, or go to the flaps. So there's, there's all kinds of combinations. It's, you just have to balance the three to get the correct exposure. Now, of course, if you don't do that, you get what you see on the bottom here, which is camera shake or wobbly pictures. And there are some, some things that you can do about that if the physical circumstances constrain what you're able to do with the camera or the lighting. But um, you know, typically people look at a picture and say, oh, I missed focus. Well, well modern autofocus is reasonably good. Um, a lot of those photographs, uh, you're going to see movement in the subject. The subject will be moving and they won't be sharp. Or the whole picture will have sort of a side to side or an up and down movement and that's usually a sign of camera shake. So evaluating exposure. Um, 
one of the things I want to say right up front is that the L, although the LCD on the digital on a digital camera can help you evaluate your exposure, looking at the picture on the LCD, the LCD in that circumstance is not your friend. It's not really a great way to evaluate how good your picture is. Um, they're very very limited devices. I would encourage you to look at the photo and see if you framed it right and if somebody's eyes are closed or something like that. But one of the better tools around uh, for evaluating your exposure is the histogram, which is available through a button or activation on the back of the camera. The histogram is just a, a graph of light intensity from darks on the left to brights on the right. Um, and you really want to try and keep that mountain in the middle. And you can see that just over to the right, those highlights just might be off the chart. They're just kissing over there. And that's probably slightly overexposed. Uh, if that straight line that you see there was actually touching the right edge of the rectangle, I would say that that shot needs to be dialed down a little bit. But you do want to look at the histogram and get to know it. That is your friend, and it is going to help you. Uh, another thing you can do is turn on the blinkies in the camera so that anything that's a highlight that's overexposed will blink at you. And although that's not totally reliable, I, I would still be looking to the histogram, the blinkies uh, are sometimes very helpful. And of course the spider cube, we talked a little bit about that before and I'm not going to dive into a long explanation about it, but you can use that to uh, set a custom white balance in your camera. You can fill the frame and actually set the camera's white balance in your lighting conditions. And you can also put the spider cube in the frame to later help you color correct and you can also use it to evaluate exposure. So it's a very, very useful, versatile tool. Yeah, the, the couple of comments I'd make about this is you cannot trust the um, blinking highlight exposure controls unless you white balance on a neutral object like the spider cube. That will allow you to trust that so that you can use your histogram. And then, of course, the very best thing to look at in the histogram is the cube because it gives you known whites and grays and blacks so that the lumps in the histogram have uh, much more meaning than when you're aimed at some random object. Yeah, he's right about that. If, you know, the, the classic example of this is to take a flat gray card or something that's strictly gray and fill the frame with it and shoot it. If your exposure is perfect, you'll see a straight line right in the middle of the histogram. So if you have the spider cube, then of course you have different services with different tones. It's actually incredibly useful in that respect as well. Okay, David, these are, these are your photos, so it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to start by saying, has anyone here ever seen Santa Claus carrying a spear before? <laughs> so, so what this is actually is the Tyrolean Saint Nick and, uh, and his helper. Um, who is he's from um, UPS? <laughs> yes, he looks like he's from UPS. He has kind of a confused history. He he was actually, I believe, a black slave at one point in time, and uh, now he's just sooty instead of being black. So it's a little confusing. Uh, but without getting into the politically correct details of of Saint Nicholas in in northern Italy and Switzerland and Austria, uh, the issue here is the first photo I shot was lousy lousy enough to show up very clearly on the LCD. And I said, whoa, I need to increase my ISO. I need to get this camera on a, on a rigid surface. I need to pay attention to what I'm doing because these are going to be very challenging conditions to shoot under, very low light. It doesn't look low light by the time you've edited it in Lightroom, but one of the reasons that this image, even the good one, is thin is because I was shooting in the dark. Now, I'm not going to use a flash because these guys are visiting with little children, and I don't want to interfere with you know the the life event that's taking place by flashing uh, Santa Claus and blinding him in the midst of his uh, discussion with these little kids. So that's where you know a newer camera would with uh, better ISO capabilities and so on would have taken a better photo of this. This was back in the days so when I believe this would have been an Olympus E1 several years ago. But nevertheless, you know this it's possible to turn results like those on the left to results like those on the right with most any reasonable camera if you simply pay attention to your settings and your and the stuff that David has been nagging you about for the last time. <laughs> I was going to say well said until you threw nagging. <laughs> <laughs> so camera support, we all need a little help now and then. Now, 
one of the tricks I use all the time is I brace the camera against a door jam or a wall or a light post, anything that you know won't fight back. <laughs> Usually it's not a person because then they'll punch me out or something. But I will lean against a wall or I'll get down on one knee and brace the camera against, um, against me. Anything to keep the camera from moving and a nice smooth shutter squeeze will avoid the kind of photograph that you see on the right here. Now actually that was done deliberately but it's a great illustration of camera shake. Um, there are tripods out there. Tripods used to be the kind of thing where you saved your money and you saved your money and finally you were able to afford one. And it's not the case anymore. There's so many good tripods out there. Big ones, small ones. Um, there's ones you can stick to a wall. There's ones that are bean bags. In any event, particularly with small cameras, because they're small and, and a lot of them don't have a viewfinder, you have to hold it out in front of you. But even the smaller DSLRs tend to move around a little bit. Um, get yourself a camera support, even if it's just a monopod, you know, if you're working in a crowd. Uh, it will make a world of difference. A monopod will give you at least one stop more of, uh, of uh, latitude and, and less camera shake than nothing at all. Well, phone cameras, um, you know, not my favorite thing for taking pictures, but everybody's using them. We all know that, that probably there's more pictures taken with phones right now than with any other camera. Um, a lot of them aren't so great, but that's a different story. There are clip-on lenses that are pretty cool for these cameras. Um, they improve things quite a bit. In fact, I own the Alclip. Uh, and that wide angle really makes a difference when I want an impromptu shot of something that I'm, I've walked by. Um, the flash on these things is very, very limited and low light photos, except in a couple of the very latest cameras, are incredibly noisy. Um, but they're there and, you know, the best camera is the one you have with you. And uh, so think about it as a backup, if nothing else. Now let's talk about posing and backgrounds. And you know, these questions, they're really worth taking a look at. This is sort of in the, in the same vein as what I was talking about in terms of pre-planning. Think about the photograph you want to take. And you know, looking at this image, and you know, this is a stock photo, but it's a very nice stock photo, and it's very well done uh, for a number of reasons. Um, just to give you some, some tips here, Look at the positioning of the hands. Look at the way the hands mirror each other and everybody has their hands in front of them and their hands are relaxed. These folks have been coached by a good photographer. You've got a couple of good relaxed smiles. You've got good fill light. You know, it's a good photograph and it was obviously thought out. And because there's a small child involved, everybody got down on the floor. So this is what I'm talking about. This was thought about, it was considered, it was planned out. It's not everybody sitting on the couch grinning for the camera. It's a keeper. It's a lifetime photograph. And anybody can do this just by thinking about, you know, a few of the elements and trying to position things so that they work well and they're harmonized in the camera. Props are great. Um, watch for the angles. Use an unconventional camera position. Get down low, get high, get off to the side. Uh, if you do have to shoot a group, which we all know now that David won't do, but some of us will, if you're going to shoot a group, mix them up. You can have them standing, kneeling, sitting. Um, you don't have to have groups all in a clump. You can string them out, separate them into two groups, uh, you know, close to each other. Um, and don't be afraid to coach and direct and, and you know, manage your shot. In any event, plan ahead and think a little bit unconventionally and you'll find that you get some terrific photographs. Now, here's some environmental stuff. Um, David, you want to take this one? Yes, what we're looking at here is um, a very classic thing to do during the holidays. I mean, somebody else has already decorated. The best decorations you're going to see are going to be in shop windows and you can get great photographs of great Christmas stuff, perfect Christmas card material, simply by walking around and shooting shop windows. Well, you have uh, three or four tips that go along with that. One is if 
if you shoot at night, that will eliminate most of the glare and reflections on the glass and will get you more of your subject and less of your distraction. That's what you can see the difference here. Another thing you can do is if you can put the lens of the camera flat against the glass, it will seal out external light sources. Uh, so the glass that you're shooting through is effectively uh, invisible. However, that's only going to get you a straight shot. It doesn't work so well from an angle. You can put the lens up close and cup your hand over the other side and do things like that to attempt to improve it. And then the last tip would be um, if you use a polarizer on your camera lens as a filter, that can often reduce what you're seeing in the glass and show you more of what you're seeing through the glass. Now, there's another type of photo that we're not demonstrating here, which is the one where you want both what's in side the window and what's being reflected in the window in the same image. And the best way to control the ratio between those two is, of course, with a polarizing filter. You know, now that you said something about reflections, I think I can see you in one of those silver balls. Ah, oh, very interesting. That's me. That's the photographer. That's funny. Okay, let's talk a little bit about editing. Um, I want to show you what's out there and talk a little bit about what's available. I'm not going to talk in detail about how to do the photo editing. There's plenty of material around you know, about that. Um, the first thing to do, though, is get it right in the camera. You, there's no substitute for getting that shot. Fix it in Photoshop or fix it in Lightroom is, is a delusion because if the photo is off, you're going to spend a lot of time to get something that many times is going to be at best, it's going to be an average shot. If you really want photographs that pop, get it right in the camera first, and then enhance it later with your image editor. Um, one of the things, you know, if you're on a low budget, one of the things to think about is that if you're going to get a camera for Christmas, or you just got one to shoot for with Christmas, a lot of them come with halfway decent or pretty decent editing software, and Nikon and Canon among them. Um, there are is sort of in the same league as iPhoto, which is at the top of the screen here, and have basic controls, but they still work reasonably well. Now, the workflow that I normally use is to sort and select. I go through a color correction or, and, or color saturation management cycle. I look at exposure and brightness, um, sharpness, and cropping, and then go on to sharing or print and printing. Now, one thing I want to point out is that it's quite difficult to do a good job of editing a photograph on a display that hasn't been calibrated. And Data Color does make tools for that. Um, two of the units that I'd recommend would be the Spider 4 Pro or the Spider 4 Elite. And at the end of the day, what they do is, here's my pointer, is they'll take colors that are being presented to you a little bit washed out or a little bit off key and turn them, turn those colors into the right bright, vibrant colors that you need to see to do a good job while you're editing. So an uncalibrated display is not your friend. A calibrated display will help you enormously in getting the right kinds of, uh, the right kind of editing done in the right way on your photographs. Now in iPhoto, uh, I believe there is one newer version of iPhoto than this, but this will get the point across. Um, the, there's some basic tools called quick fixes, and I've circled them in red. Um, very helpful if you just want to do a quick run through. And uh, you know, iPhoto is a useful tool. And again, a lot of the the software that's provided by the camera manufacturers is in this is in the same category as this this kind of uh, application. And of course, if you go to um, adjust in here, there are many more tools than there used to be. Um, quite useful. There's a real exposure adjustment tool. There's a histogram. Um, the basics, yes. Uh, extremely useful, you betcha. If we go to Lightroom, um, there's an interesting thing in Lightroom that I want to point out is that all of us are going to take a lot of pictures in the next few weeks. And some of those pictures are obviously going to be really good and some will be better than others. But what you can do in Lightroom is if you see this gallery here, this is in the library module, you can actually um, give a rating to each photograph and then you can sort them down below by rating. And these are unsorted, but it's quite easy to go up to, it's under one of these menu, um, menu drop downs 
I'm pretty sure it's either under edit or view. And you can sort them by the date they were shot, you can sort them by the rating, you can sort them by a number of things. And that way you can push all the really good ones up to the front of the line. Those are the ones that you're going to want to be working on anyway. And of course in Lightroom 4 there's uh, incredible versatility and controls and I've circled them in red here on the right. You have a good histogram. <clears throat> there's also quite a few presets on the left and uh, you know I encourage you to take a look at more sophisticated uh, image editing software like this. It's not that hard to use. Adobe has an incredible collection of um, what I call hands-on videos recorded and they're under what's called Adobe TV if you want to look that up on the, on the internet and uh, you can quickly learn how to edit your photos in the develop module and get great results. Yes, it's, there's no question that moving up to Lightroom now that it's quite affordable and moving up to Lightroom really to a large degree means moving up to RAW is one of the biggest steps forward that a serious photographer can take. Now yeah, it was I, pointed out to me David that um, there's a little yellow spider icon in the bar of your computer at the top telling us that your monitor is, is out of calibration and you need to recalibrate it. I uh, thought that was great that somebody caught that. It's great that somebody caught that. Yes, I was supposed to do it on the first of the month and I've been lazy. I, well this I is your secondary it. machine isn't it? I mean it's not the only computer you use. That's true, but it's funny that somebody saw that. I've been, I've been trying to ignore it. <laughs> um, so let's see, what do I do now? I go to the next screen. Yes. <laughs> Sharing. Um, interesting thing here. We have social media. We can share any photograph anywhere, anytime, just about. Um, but the first thing, you know, a lot of people just fire things off to, to the social media. Back up those files. You know, the, the fact that you can, um, you know, from, say, Lightroom, you can pub, or from iPhoto, you can publish things, I think, pretty much directly to something like Facebook. The first thing I encourage you to do is copy the photos off that card onto your computer and then copy them to a second storage device, a second hard drive. And the reason is, is that it's not a matter of whether or not a hard drive is going to die. It's just a matter of when. And the first sign of trouble is usually the last gasp. That's another little tip for you. Um, so back up your files. And do it as soon as you copy them from the camera or the card. You'll be a lot better off. If something happens to that folder, you'll just kick yourself. Um, going back to sharing, um, you know, email, websites, holiday cards. Um, do you print yourself or do you outsource it? Um, a a couple, of t a couple of tips though, whether you're going to go to a kiosk at, over at a department store, or you're going to turn them in at, at a Photoshop, or you're going to send them in to, um, oh, what's one of the online services that people use, uh, Miller's oh. or Snapfish or something like that. Um, send them just a couple and have them make tests first. And in fact, send them photographs that you know what they're supposed to look like. Maybe they're not brand new photographs. But if you're going to use a service, send them two or three and see how they do instead of sending them 200 and getting a stack of photos you don't like. Um, I do that whenever I use an outside service. I'll send them, say, make me a couple of test prints and let's see, let's see how that particular operator does with that particular machine. Um, and really the same thing applies to your own printing. Um, make a couple of prints on a particular type of paper. If you don't like the way the paper looks, maybe go down and buy a sample pack over at Staples or another business store or, for, or at Best Buy or someplace like that and make a couple of more tests and then when you get it dialed in, then make your portfolio or your collection or your album. So it will save you a little bit of time and angst and aggravation if you do it that way. Uh, now we talk a little bit about impromptu or journalistic photography. David, you want to take it away? Well, uh, it was David Saffer who put these two photos together. I'd never seen them together before and it's truly hilarious because it's clear that whoever made the little boat to go with their gingerbread house lighthouse here actually has spent time on a lobster boat. They have the right number of windows and the right configuration and that's, that's a very well built little boat. But the point here is that you never know when you're going to come across something that's unique and local. I mean, the, the, the cleverness of the little gumdrop and toothpick lobster buoys 
Money can't buy that kind of stuff. So have a camera with you. An iPhone takes excellent macro photos for close-ups like this. So even if you aren't out to take photographs and you see something like this, as soon as you say, oh, I could take a photo of that, if you have a phone in your pocket with a decent camera in it, you can take a photo of that, even if it's not going to reproduce it. 36 by 48 inches, it will get you. It will get you an image that you can that you can work with. So you know both of these are are um, iPhone images taken on the spur of the moment to capture something that was not set out to be a a uh, you know a photo shoot. And uh, both of them were certainly worth shooting. And neither one of them will make a three foot print. So there's there's <laughs> a whole variety of of issues and compromises that go with uh, shooting with different types of cameras. Uh, another one for you, David. Well, outside the box, I mean, if you intentionally use a Holga lens or a lens baby lens like this, then you will get images that have unique characteristics to them that kind of extend beyond what you get. I mean, if you, if you shoot Canon and you always use L-series lenses, then you're going to get a very predictable a high quality look from that. I believe that this image would probably make a better Christmas card, at least to my eye, than the exact same thing shot with a $5,000 lens because there's character to this and there's a level of variety that, uh, that makes it more interesting and more sympathetic. And, and you know, just for the, the things, even if you're a serious photographer, you can, you can you know, let your hair down a little and do this fun stuff as well. And you'd be surprised uh, how this stuff may appeal to people more in many cases than your official high-end photography does because of the way it reaches out, the more poetic nature of it. Um, this is one of my favorites for today. I really like this photograph. It's, got a, it's just got a lot of emotion to it. It's got a great color palette. It's got a center of focus, but there's also um, context to it, and it's just, you know, it's very evocative for me. I really like this image. It's also crooked, and that goes along with, uh, you know, the kind of uh, casual nature of the, of yeah. the shot. Yeah. So here you've got the other extreme. Here's the shot that really requires a good camera. Here's the shot that could be a fine art image. This really could be one of those big prints on the wall. And what's been done here? I mean, we've taken the Santa out of Santa Claus here. This is an image where all the color has been removed and where uh, you're, you have this very serious, very dark image that still manages to express a sense of celebration, a sense of holiday that you um, would not necessarily have a better, more powerful image if you left this in color. Having those little lights have a little bit of, you know, a colored tinge to them doesn't does not improve uh, the way that they they work in this image. It's it's as if the stars have come down out of the constellations and are are hanging out in the street right over your head. So having them star colored really matters more than than having them colored. So it actually might have decreased that magic in this image to leave it in color. You know, I like it very much as a black and white. Well, it, it, it also, we put it this one here last for a very good reason. We wanted to encourage people to always reach for the fine art photo in whatever you're doing, be it a, a macro on your Christmas tree, uh, be it a, a shot of, of people, or be it a, you know, an architectural street shot of this nature. Any of those types of photos can transcend the family photo album and end up being a decent art photo if, if you manage to get the elements in them uh, to work together. Absolutely. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about the promos, and I'm sure we have a winner. Yes, we do. I'm, and you're going to have to forgive me, Hunter, with my pronunciation of your last name, but it looks like Hunter Pinchon is the winner of a Spider 4 Pro. Congratulations. I want to wish everybody a very, very happy holiday season. It's it's been a, a an a year that maybe was a little too exciting, and I hope next year is a little less exciting. Um, there's a 20% off of all Spider products purchased at datacolor.com. There's a promo code. Please take note of this. It's photo 20. It's valid from today, 12/12/12, through 12/19. 
my name is David Saffer, and there's uh, and my partner's name is David Toby, and you can see that we both have our internet uh, websites and blogs posted here for for your use. Uh, both of us on our WordPress blogs have quite a bit of information about photography and color management and printmaking that can be helpful to you. I also encourage my students, if you do have a question, I really try to answer them. Uh, send me an email, dsaffer at mac.com. If I don't answer you in the first 24 hours, uh, please assume that it got lost in the torrent of emails that I get and send it again. There's nothing wrong with that and I'll do my best to answer you. Um, thanks for your attention. I'm glad you all could make it. Have a great holiday and we'll talk to you next time.